Good morning. My name is Casey Travis, and uh, I get the, the privilege of sharing some things with you guys this morning. I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really, really excited. Um, it's been a little while since I have done this. Um, I was a, a pastor in other churches for uh, a number of years, but it's, but it's been a little while, and so I feel like I got like, all this stuff like, pent up in me right now, right? You've got like, like three years of sermons, so everybody just hold on to your seats this morning, all right? It's going to be a good time. Um, my wife Jessica and I met uh, early on in life. I was right out of high school. She was a little older. I married an older woman. Did, I was one of those, right? Um, but, uh, but we met, and, and one of the things that immediately drew us together was that we were both really, really passionate about doing something huge for the Lord. That's what we wanted. We wanted something grand, something on a grand scale. We wanted to be on the front lines. We wanted to be where the action was, and, and that was something that we, ju- we would just talk about all the time, all the time, and and, uh, and after we were married, it just continued on. We began setting these plans for our life that we were going to go into full-time ministry. And that was, that was really all that we thought about. And so people were talking about career tracks and all this kind of stuff. And all we could think about was going into full-time ministry. Um, for us, that didn't really look so much like the church. Um, it looked more like missions, um, you know, something like that. And so we were, you know, we were talking about traveling. We were talking about working with youth. Uh, we were talking about all these different ideas and looking at all these different organizations. And, uh, and as happens in life, um, directed by God's good plan and his grace and his, you know, and knowing us better than we know ourselves, um, we ran into all these roadblocks. I mean, that just kind of, it just happened. And these, these shut doors for us. And, and we would talk about that too. Man, it just feels like we're running into brick walls. Every time we want to do something that's so good and that's so right, and we just keep feeling like we just keep running into these brick walls, you know? And so as kind of, as life happens, you know, we were, we were young, we were married, and I was like, well, you know, I, I got to do something in the meantime while we're, while we're waiting to go minister, right? Until we can get out there and start ministering. So I better find a job and you know, and my dad, he was, uh, he was a contractor all my life, and I swore I never wanted anything to do with construction at all. And so somebody, a family friend, offered me a job in their construction company, and I took it. So, of course I did, right? And, uh, but it was always this thing for me that I was like, I'm doing this, but this is, this is just while I'm waiting, right? I'm just, I'm waiting until God releases us into full-time ministry. And this was the language we used to use all the time. God's going to release us into full-time ministry. So while I was there, um, I got the opportunity to, to meet this really wonderful man. His name was Marvin. Um, and Marvin was this, I thought at the time, being you know, like 20 years old, he was like this ancient guy, you know, realize now not so much. I mean, he was getting close to retirement was all, right? But uh, yeah, to me at that time, he was ancient and he was wise. He was also short and he had a pot belly and he was kind of funny to look at a little bit. But he had like this magnetic, amazing kind of personality that would just kind of, that would just draw you into him, right? And he was always smiling. He was always laughing. And you guys know people like this, right? I mean, there's that, that kind of person that just like, they just pull you into their world. They, they pull you into their circle and immediately you feel like you're welcome there. You feel like you're, you're, you're family and, and all that. And, my, and Marvin became a mentor to me. Um, I, he, was from the, he was from the deep south. He was from Louisiana. So he had that slow southern drawl, you know, that was kind of nice to listen to. And, and he was funny. He was quirky. He was all these, all these kinds of things. And, and one day, um, as we were talking, um, I found this connection point with Marvin. I found out that, that uh, in, in previous years, before he had come to work for the same construction company, he had been ordained as a minister in the Southern Baptist Church. Not sure why that was so appealing to me, but it was appealing to me at the time because it was like, well, there's this connection point here. You've been in full-time ministry before. I want to be in full-time ministry. We can talk about this, and I can learn from you, and I can figure some things out. It was a little different. I wanted to be in missions more. You were in the church. That's totally fine, but I, I just can't wait to get out there and get in full-time ministry. And, and so one day I was having this, this conversation with Marvin, and we were talking about our plans, and I was telling him you know, about how this, I'm doing construction now, and you know, I want to work 
work hard, but this isn't what I want to do with my life. I want to go. I want to be in this ministry. And, and I think I was telling him because really I was, I was looking for some, you know, some good vibes back, right? To me, you're looking for, you know, hoping it was kind of impressing to him a little bit. And he'd be like, oh, son, that's a worthy calling and all this, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? That's what you're looking for. Instead, Marvin said something that just rocked me to my core. One statement, and it was like a kick in the gut. Marvin said to me, son, if you're not in full-time ministry right now, you never will be. Oh, I was 20 years old for crying out loud. 20 years old. I got years ahead of me that I can go into full-time ministry. Marvin, what are you talking about, right? And it and, he, and the, the worst thing about it was that he never elaborated on it. I mean, he never, like, he never fixed it. I mean, he just kind of, he just left it hanging out there. And, you know, and I was like, Marvin, you don't understand, man. You don't, you don't get it. You don't get my life. You know, all this kind of stuff, right? That's a 20-year-old thing to say, right? Um, and it took some time for me. I mean, I, I went home, and I was talking with, with Jess, and, and I was telling her, you'll never believe what Marvin said. Even she, she was like coming to my defense, you know, whoa, Marvin, what is he thinking, you know, all this kind of stuff. But, uh, but it started to kind of sink in a little bit. And slowly over time, I started to realize that Marvin was talking about something altogether different. See, when I was talking about going into full-time ministry, I was talking about an occupation. I was talking about something I wanted to do. And when Marvin said to me, if you're not in full-time ministry right now, you never will be, what Marvin was talking about was who I am. And it took a while to get that. It took a while for that to sink in. But there was a point in which it did sink in, and things radically shifted for Jess and I. The whole course of our life changed. And it was because of that one statement that was said. Now, what I've come to believe today is that Marvin really understood what Paul was talking about in this passage we're going to look at today. And so today we're going to pick up in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 15. So if you guys want to turn to that, you can. Um, But Paul talks about who we are. Not about what we do, but he talks about who we are. In light of everything else that we've been covering over the weeks as we've been going through this letter to the Ephesians and all the things that that Paul has been talking about, what Paul has been leading up to is who we are. And because of who we are, this is who we are to be. So chapter 5, verse 15, Paul says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, because of that, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Paul says, look carefully then how you go about your daily life, how you go where you are going, how you peripateo. Brad introduced that word to us several weeks ago, right? Look carefully how you peripateo. Peripateo wisely. Peripateo intentionally. Why? Because the days are evil. Now, I'm just going to say right now, I, I'm not one of those kind of guys that looks at everything going on. It's like, oh, the whole world's going to heck and, you know, and everything's getting worse and worse all the time. And it's all going to keep getting worse until some, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those. Um, I, in fact, I, I carry this, this kind of thought that as I look around, there's a lot of really good things that are going on in the world. There's a lot of redemption that's happening in the world. There's a lot of forward motion that's going on in the world also. But you don't have to look very long to realize that there are those who are out there, there are systems that are out there, there are governments that are out there, and so on and so on, who are not as eager for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven as we might be here, right? And that's a force of evil that's at work in the world. And so Paul says, because the days are evil, don't be foolish. Don't be without reason. But instead, understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, this question of what is the will of the Lord is one of those I think every single one of us in here have probably asked at some point in time or another. In fact, if I asked for a show of hands, I'd probably get every single hand here. And we might change this a little bit. We might change it to 
I don't know what the will of God is for my life. I just wish I knew what God's will for my life was, right? Or maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's just, I don't know what the purpose of life is, right? But somehow in there, this is the question that we ask. And I think it's part of our our deep humanity, that longing of humanity to belong to something, to be a part of something, that we ask ourselves this question, I wonder what the purpose of my life is. I wonder what God's will for my life is. I wonder what God's will in general is. And so Paul says here, he says, don't be foolish, don't, but I want you to be intentional about this. I want you to understand what the will of the Lord is. And this isn't, in, I really don't believe that Paul was talking about in like some Sunday school sense, right? In some like John 3.16 sense of God's will is that, you know, that the whole world be saved because he loves everyone and none should perish. This is powerful. This is absolutely powerful. But what Paul is talking about is a will of the Lord that we can walk in. A will of the Lord that we can parapateo, that we can find ourselves moving in, that we can be involved in. So, Paul, if we're supposed to understand what the will of the Lord is, then why don't you tell us what the will of the Lord is, right? And the amazing thing about Ephesians is that that, I believe, is exactly what Paul has been doing from the beginning of this letter. I think he crafted this letter specifically to share what the will of the Lord is. And so if you go back over the past 12 weeks that we've been spending in this series, that that Brad and John have been talking week after week about this, we're going to see them laying out over and over again what Paul says is the will of the Lord. And if you've missed any of those, I'd say just go back and listen to the the podcast or watch it online or whatever, because there's some really important stuff that I'm just going to touch on here today by means of just going back and and just, you know, we're going to reflect on here really quick. But there's there's some deep things in here. That are, that are specifically re- pertaining to what God's will is. That's why we had this printed up here, okay? So what we've done here is I've just listed out for you on this sheet everything that Paul has said about the will of the Lord and what the will of the Lord is for us and what the will of the Lord is in his grand purpose and design too. And what I would hope that you guys would be able to do with this, take this, just drop it into your Bible, maybe you tape it to your fridge or your mirror in your, in your bathroom or something like that as a constant reminder of what God's will is for us, okay? Because if we're supposed to be wise, if we're supposed to understand what the will of the Lord is, then maybe we should have it in front of us, Right? Maybe we should focus on it a little bit. Maybe we should concentrate on it a little bit. And so, this is what Paul says the will of the Lord is. He says the will of the Lord is that we would walk as children of light, bringing light to the darkness. Paul says the will of the Lord is that we would be imitators of God as his beloved children and that we would walk in love. The will of the Lord is that we would put on a new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The will of the Lord is that we would exercise our gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. The will of the Lord is that we would be eager to be one in him. We would be eager to be unified in him. The will of the Lord is that we would walk in the manner that reflects our family name as adopted sons and daughters. Adopted sons and daughters of God himself. This is what it means when Brad was saying that we would parapateo our kaleo. That we would walk in the family name. The will of the Lord is that we would walk in power. We would walk in power to his glory. The will of the Lord is that we would be rooted and grounded in love. That we would be citizens of of the kingdom of God, not aliens and strangers, but citizens of the kingdom of God, that we would be built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The will of the Lord is that we would be alive together with Christ, putting off our old selves, that we would no longer be dead, but we would come to life in him. The will of the Lord is that we may have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in our knowledge of him. That we would have the eyes of our hearts enlightened to know the hope to which he has called us. That we might know the riches of his glorious inheritance and the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who place our confidence in him for all things. 
Now, if this was the only thing that Paul said about God's will for us, I think it would be enough, wouldn't it? That we would know the immeasurable greatness of his power, that the eyes of our hearts would be open. And the will of the Lord is that we would walk as redeemed, forgiven, adopted sons and daughters according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. That's the word lavish. I mean, I like that word. When you think about like this lavishing of grace, I mean, it almost sounds like wet, doesn't it? It almost like sloppy, right? That we're just like lavished in grace. That's an amazing, amazing kind of thought. But if you're like me at all, you look at this list and you say, that is an awesome list. I want to be like that. I want to be that kind of person. I love that that is God's will for my life. But why is it his will for my life? What am I supposed to do with that? Because remember, I, want to, I, I like to be on the front lines. I like to be out there. I like to be, I like to be where the action is. I want, to, I want to be involved in what God is doing in the world. And all of these things that we just looked at that Paul said is God's will for my life, God's will for your life, God's will for our lives, these are things that are really wonderful, but what are we supposed to do with that, Right? Where are we supposed to go with this? Where do we put this into action? And so there's a couple more things that, that Paul says that are very specific to not just to us, but to what God's plan is for all of time and all of creation for all of the world. And so if you flip that paper over on the other side, these are a couple of things that Paul says, this is what God's ultimate plan is. What Paul says is that his specific purpose, God's specific purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, is that he might unite all things in himself, things in the heavens and the things on earth. This is what God intends to do. What God intends to do is to take all of this broken humanity, all of this creation that's in existence, and pull it into himself. Why? Because he is the source of life. And what God intends to do is to pull all of his created life back into the source of himself. Sounds a little familiar to what Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in the heavens, right? And this is what Paul is talking about. This is God's intention. And this is what the created order was in the very beginning. See, when when God originally set out in the beginning, he spoke all of these things into existence and he, and he looked at everything and he said, this is so good. He was so excited with himself, right? I love everything I've done here. This is amazing. This is wonderful. And he was deeply involved in all of it. He was flowing in it and through it and everything was found in him. There was this direct communion that was happening between he and Adam and Eve on a regular basis. And then he says to Adam, okay, now it's yours. I want you to run with it now at this point. I want you to take care of all of this. And so many times, I think when we talk about the gospel, we start at the fall, but really it's at creation where the gospel starts because this is where God intended things to be in the first place, everything to be found solely in him. But we did make a mess of things, didn't we? And at one point in time, Adam and Eve decided that they were going to follow their own kingdom. They were going to run under their own rule and reign as opposed to him And we broke the system. We broke ourselves. We broke creation itself. And God's intended purpose, looking at all of this throughout history and the the thousands and thousands of years that we have been here, is to this, this plan that he began in Christ to pull everything back into himself, to heal the brokenness, to right the wrongs, to undo the chaos and bring order to it again because he is the source of life. The second thing that Paul tells us about God's plan, and it is directly related to the first thing he told us, is that he has raised Jesus above all other ruling authorities and power structures. Not only now, but for all eternity to come, and we as his body will rule and reign with him for all eternity. 
I don't know about you, but that's a little bit overwhelming for me to take in right now. That Jesus' intention is that I would rule and reign with him for all eternity. That's exactly what Paul says, though, when he says we will be raised up to the right hand of Christ with him as he is raised up over all the principalities and powers over the world. And I say, I don't know if I can handle that. I don't know if I'm the right guy for that. Because if you remember the mess that we made out of it the first time with Adam, and I haven't done any better with my life than Adam did with his up to this point, right? The reality is, though, is that what Jesus is saying, or what Paul is saying about Jesus here, is that he's not raising us up to rule and reign on our own, but he's raising us up with Christ, with Christ as our head to rule and reign with him. So the responsibility falls on Jesus then. The responsibility doesn't fall on me. And what Jesus asks of us is to follow him. What Jesus asks of us is to trust him, to respond to him, to listen to him, to learn from him so that he might create in us the kind of character that he might create in us the, the kind of thought process and the, the way of approaching life that we actually can handle ruling and reigning with him. And he's the one that's responsible for that. Now, why is this important that we would rule and reign with him? Because he's pulling everything back into himself. Because again, he's bringing order to the chaos. He's banishing the darkness with light. He is reconciling all things to himself. And what he's choosing to do is to involve us in that process. He's choosing to involve anyone who would place their confidence in him, who would, who would place their faith in him, their trust in him. He's choosing to involve us in, in this plan of bringing order to the chaos again, the reconciliation of all things. And this is, really, this is really important because this means that we have to live intentionally with our lives, that we are moving somewhere, that we are becoming something together. And we don't have to be concerned whether we're up to it or not. We have to be concerned with following him. Okay, now, why does he choose to use us? And this is the next thing that Paul says. Paul says that through us, the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be seen in all the world. Now, this word manifold here is actually a really simple word. It just means multicolored. All right, now, when you think about the church, not just here amongst us, but certainly right here too, but across all of Spokane, across the whole country, across all the nations that exist, we're a bit multicolored, aren't we? And what, and what Paul says is that through this multicolored painting, this, this multicolored tapestry of his church, God is going to make known his wisdom. Now you think about that for a, a second, right? That we are the ones that the world will look to and say, my gosh, can you believe the wisdom of God? My gosh, can you, can you believe what God can do with so little? Can you believe that with these broken ones who continue to make a mess of things over and over again, that God can accomplish so much in the world that he can actually accomplish his plan? This truly is a testimony to his manifold wisdom. And this gets to play out in and through our lives as we follow him and as we move into uh, working with him towards his great purposes. So, the final thing that Paul says here is that we would be reconciled to God through the cross. But it doesn't end with our reconciliation. Because Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and if you want to turn over there and look at that, this is one of my, one of my favorite life passages in all of Scripture. Paul says, All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, 
We are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. This is where the rubber meets the road right here. This is where we get to latch on to a sense of mission and a sense of vision. This is what my mentor Marvin was talking about when he said, if you're not in ministry right now, in full-time ministry right now, you never will be. Because what, what Paul is talking about here is that as we are drawn into this plan of God and we walk out our reconciliation, that we become ministers of reconciliation to the entire world. And this is not an occupational role. This is not something we punch in and punch out of. This is who we are now. We are ambassadors. We are, we are those who are sent out from him to do this work of reconciliation, to, to spread this message of reconciliation. We are diplomats. We are taking up residence in a foreign land right here and right now, but we are still under his ruling authority. We are under his sovereign authority. And our announcement, our, our message, our proclamation of the gospel to the entire world is that the king is returning. And when he returns, he is going to come to this place, to this world, and he is going to set up his capital city, his new Jerusalem, right here amongst us, and the good king will rule and reign over everything again. This is what our message is. And his intention is not to wipe out and to destroy. His intention is to unite. His intention is to reconcile. His intention is to bring all things in heaven and on earth together in himself. And this is what light looks like. This is what eternal life looks like. This is the gospel. See, we get to be swept up in this message. We get to be swept up into this eternal plan. And, and not just here on Sunday mornings, not just in our weekly Bible studies or our home group times or, you know, when we get together for coffee with people, but this is a 24-7 way of life for the one who has been reconciled in him. That we are now, we take on our own ministry of reconciliation wherever we are, whoever we are, whatever our context is, this is how we live our lives out. So in light of this then, Paul says, okay, this is the grand plan. This is what God's plan is, right? This is what God intends to do. Now we're going to bring it home. And Paul says, now we're going to get pointed and we're going to get into each one of the intimacy of your individual lives and we're going to see how this plays out. And so in, back to chapter 5 again in verse 18, Paul says, so because of all of this, he says, don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. But instead... Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so he says, when you come together then, when this gathering comes together, and it's all its multicolored, its differences and all of that, your intention should be to submit to one another. Your intention should be to consider each other higher than yourselves. Your intention should be to serve one another. And the question that immediately pops to my mind, I've had to wrestle with this so many times, is how in the world could this possibly be safe? How in the world could it possibly be for me to be, to be safe while I am submitting myself to every single one of you? Some of you are going to take advantage of me. Some of you are not going to submit in return. Some of you are not even going to be kind. How in the world could this possibly be safe? And what Paul speaks to here is that within the body of Christ, we've all got to be in this together. We all have to be under this one mindset. And he goes into further detail in this in Philippians, if you want to look at that sometime. But he says, you've got to be of one mind in Christ. We've got to consider each other collectively, each other's good for each other's benefit in love. 
See, this is exactly the kind of community that will put on display the manifold, multicolored wisdom of God, won't it? An idea that is so foreign to the world, a concept that is so foreign to the world of submission, of submitting ourselves to one another, that this is the very thing that God would use to show his great wisdom and his great power in us. And it is the very example that Jesus himself set when he submitted himself by stepping into human flesh and when he submitted himself to the the tortures of the cross. This is exactly what he led us in. And he says, now you are to follow me. So the second question that that I've heard asked before then is, well, then how does anything ever get accomplished? I mean, if all we're doing is going, no, you first, no, you first, no, you first, no, you first. I mean, how do we ever get through the door out there, right? How do we ever get out of the parking lot here if we're always submitting to one another? And the question I would ask in return is, if Jesus was the one who led us in submission, what did he fail to accomplish? Nothing. In fact, it was through his submission that he completely and perfectly fulfilled the will of his Father, right? And if it's his example, and we are to follow him, then we must be of the same mindset then. And I would also say that what Jesus taught us in his submission is that submission is an action. It is not simply preference. That I am, as I am preferring you, as I come into contact with you throughout my day, throughout my week, that I will actually act differently towards you that I will actually act in service towards you, that I will actually act towards you, period. So submission is not merely a preferring of someone else or giving up myself. Submission is acting differently towards one another. So then Paul takes this and he, and he pinpoints it a little bit more sharply here. He, he tunes that laser in a little bit more here in this next very famous overly complicated from the pulpit, so too many times passage here. Wives, submit to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now here's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to gloss over this because I don't want to go into it too much, all right? I'm going to leave that for Brad, all right? Brad can go into all the subtle nuances of this, and he can parse it out and as much as he feels like he wants to do with it. But this morning, we're going to focus on the big picture of this and how this this falls in line with everything else that that Paul is talking about in the realm of submitting to one another. There's a couple of points that I I want to point out here in what Paul says, because there's there's something that could just just retune our thinking here a little bit. Because again, I believe this has been an abused passage way too many times. The first thing that I'd like to say is that culturally, when Paul wrote this, women were subservient to men in every way. I mean, that's just the way that it was. And when you read what Paul actually said here, two times, not just once, but two times, Paul says, wives, submit to your own husband. Not everyone else's husband. You're not to give yourself out just wildly to any man that comes and says that he wants something from you, but submit yourself to your own husband. And I think this is actually a powerfully progressive statement by Paul, where Paul is saying, hey, we are to live in a constant state of submission within the body of Christ to one another. When it comes to your married relationships, though, wives, you just think about your husbands. You don't have to think about every other man that's out there, okay? And then he follows that up with what he says to the husbands. And he says, husbands, You are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There's that unity right there, right? Be unified together. 
This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she respects her husband. See, and what Paul talks about this in the, in the grand scheme of everything else that he's talking about is that when it comes to the intimate married relationships that we have, those, those committed relationships that we have in this context, this is a picture of something that is far grander than just us. This is a picture of what Christ loves, Christ's love for his bride, the church. And so what God has done here is he has opened up the heavens and he has brought into the very midst of our most intimate relationships this, this very uh, strong statement of how Christ feels about the church. And it's a mystery. And one has to do with the other. They're not separated from each other. And how we're to be in the world and how we're to be in the church to one another we are to be even on a more intimate level within our own families. And this includes loving and laying down our lives for each other and cherishing each other and always with Jesus as our example. Always with, with following him in mind. And then our kids. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. This is my, my mom loved for me to memorize this verse. She would always tell me, you know what the Bible says, okay? This next part, fathers... Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord becomes a little bit harder for us sometimes. See, teaching our children the promised blessings that come along with submitting, come along with obedience, is so much easier when we are also submitting to them and we are not provoking them to anger. It's really hard to engage the heart of my daughters when I've just ticked them off. And so when we can live even with an attitude of submission towards our own children as members of the body of Christ, then what we get to focus on is not being right or not being author you know, having our authority put in place or, or winning the argument, but it's to love and nurture them into Christ-likeness. Paul goes on one more place here, and he says, okay, we've talked about the married relationship. We've talked about husbands and wives. We've talked about the church and, and the body of Christ here, and we've talked about our children, how we're to, to be with them. Now we're going to talk about the workplace. And he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would Christ. And he says, masters, he says, do the same to them. Stop your threatening knowing that he is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Any slaves here today? Anybody have a boss? Any masters here today? Anybody have people that report to you? Quite likely we're a little bit of both, right? We have people that report to us and we report to others as well, right? Well, what Paul tells us here is in this, this new way of thinking, in this realm of the kingdom, as we are living out this, this knowledge of what the plan of God is in our lives, if we have a boss, we're to submit to that boss as we would if he or she were Christ himself. And if we are the boss, and many of us, like I said, are both, we're to keep in mind that the one who is working for us is deeply loved and cherished by God, and we should treat them accordingly. So one of the things that, that happened in that, in that statement with, with Marvin that day, is we're taking all this into account, and I'm thinking about all these different ways that, that my life is supposed to reflect Christ, and I'm, and I'm supposed to be being transformed in his image and likeness, and I'm, and I'm supposed to be understanding what his will is for my life. And when, when Marvin challenged me that day, the thing that began to sink in so deeply within me is that this is not just about what I do, Right? I can't go swing a hammer for eight hours a day and then go start my spiritual life. I can't, I can't get up, you know, for five days a week and, and go do, put in my 40 hours and then go do my ministry. See, the two cannot be separated for the follower of Jesus. The one who understands what the will of the Lord is cannot separate the two between. And so out of that conversation with Marvin that day, I ended up staying another five years in that construction company. 
And then I went on to spend another couple of years with my own construction company. And I was so engaged in all the, the ministry opportunities that were right in front of me when I just opened my eyes to them. The, the opportunities of coworkers and subcontractors and, and homeowners and on and on and on. All the opportunities that I got to show the love of Jesus, to communicate the, the good news of the gospel over and over and over again. That when the day came that I got a phone call from a, a pastor friend of mine and he invited me to come serve with him at his church as a youth pastor, I was like, no, I have my ministry. I already got that. I've already figured out my life is my ministry. And my wife was like, you're being an idiot. Come on, just you need to get in line here and figure out this is, yes, you can have that ministry, but you can also do this very specific thing that God is calling you to right now too. And so then I spent another almost nine years working for the church and in, in the nonprofit world and, and all of that. And then about three years ago, we made the decision to move our family here and we left our church ministry. And I went to work with my friend who owns a retail store and I now buy socks and do schedules and that kind of thing. And that could be very mundane if I did not realize that this is not about what I'm doing, this is about who I am. And who I am is a minister of reconciliation. And I can minister reconciliation while I'm doing a schedule or buying socks or engaging with my coworkers or those people who are answering to me just as easily as I can from the pulpit. Sometimes much easier. And so when it comes to those intimate relationships at, at home with my with my kids or, or my wife or, or my family members or, or whether it's in the body of Christ and interactions here or it's home groups throughout the week or whether it's in my workplace or whether it's in my neighborhood or whatever it might be, what I've come to realize is that there is no this and there is no that. There is no in here and there is no out there. There is only the kingdom of God. That's all that exists. There is the kingdom of God and it is pervasive and his plan for all creation is immense, and he is calling me into that. And because of that, I'm on mission. Wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, I'm on mission. Would you guys stand with me? Father, you are good, and your plan is great, and Lord God, my, my desire is that as, as we recognize what you are calling us into, as we recognize who we are instead, God, that, that you would draw us even more and more in and that the eyes of our hearts would be open to see the, the magnitude of the scope of your plan. We would become excited. We'd become impassioned about that we would be ever more drawn into this role of ministers of reconciliation in your kingdom and for your glory. God, thank you for loving us. We say this morning that we love you. In your name we pray, amen.